It's like the whole world has gone mad. You may have noticed that generally cosmetic procedures and surgeries are on the rise and this can be attributed to three broad factors. Firstly, Hollywood and influencers. Celebrities set the beauty standard and are the instigators of trends. The Kardashians have been pivotal in this regard, especially in bridging the gap between being celebrities and social media stars. And this means it is much easier for ordinary people to see themselves as eventually getting work done or having the same procedures done as their favorite celebrities or online faves. Secondly, technology, and especially technology's greater proximity to younger and younger generations. And thirdly, and especially in relation to technology, would be destigmatization. The stigma, which until the late 2010s had latched itself to cosmetic surgeries, is quickly eroding. This is largely due to the increased popularity of AI, and especially its growing interplay with plastic surgeries. So society's greater obsession with prolonging youthfulness, especially as we get older and are living a lot longer, and of course the virtual mainstreaming of explicit adult content without much restriction or regulation. And I would say that the latter two factors, that is technology and destigmatization, are behind another surprising rise. It may interest you to know that since 2015, the fastest growing cosmetic procedure has been the labia plasty. A labiaplasty is a cosmetic procedure which removes or reduces a woman's labia minora. That is, the flaps of skin which surround our urethra and vaginal opening. Surveying cosmetic procedures in 106 countries, the International Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery continues to consistently show that labiaplasty operations are increasing year on year by between 39 to 45 percent, costing between 4 thousand to six thousand US dollars, the labiaplasty is clearly in and is becoming more and more affordable. And this trend does not seem to be subsiding. Increasingly, adult content stars are undergoing labiaplasties to make their labia minora and majora more compact and in vogue. As a result of this rise, some plastic surgeons have noticeably tapped into this market in a rather disturbing way. This has depended on the creation of a narrative around labia that came into being during the mid-1990s and has only grown in popularity. And this narrative depends entirely on the reasons increasingly given by plastic surgeons as to why labiaplasties are so beneficial to women. Based on my research, the reasons given by plastic surgeons go as follows. Labiaplasties enhance a patient's quality of life. The clinic will often use explanations such as a woman's discomfort or pain from pinching or chafing. They always like to assert that a woman's sexual satisfaction is improved post-operation. What they noticeably always fail to mention is what may be causing the pinching or chafing, or what are the sources of a woman's distress when it comes to her inner and or outer labia, or what may be the real cause of a lack in sexual satisfaction among women. And crucially, why is modern society so grossed out by the vast majority of women's labia. Because the reality of the matter is that 50% of women have inner labia that is longer than their outer labia. But this is clearly something that society does not want to acknowledge. Have you ever come across memes such as this? Or comments like these? Have you ever dumped a girl because she had an unattractive pussy? One of the most beautiful girls I've ever been with had one of these and I was heartbroken. I thought I was in love with her until I saw her pussy looked like someone put a hand grenade between her legs and pulled the pin. The image and fantasy of a man eating out a woman as seen and depicted in explicit content has often resulted in the circulation of such memes, posts and images when these fantasies are brought into the real world escapades of couples. Comedian Matt Reif went on the Stiff Socks podcast last year and in graphic detail described how disgusted he was by the vulva of his then partner and podcaster Brooke Schofield. I just don't want your pussy to look like the gum from uh, uh, Sausage Party. You know what I mean? I don't want. I don't want. I don't want to look down and feel like 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 God left a tag on you. You know what I mean? Yeah, a little mattress. Like, 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 right. like I got a return to sender. Yeah, you know what I like mean? It's a mattress thing. You can't take it off. You just put it in your yeah, mouth and bro, call your bro, dad I, and say I'm sorry. Like, sometimes it looks like a. <laughs> sometimes it looks like they have a zipper on there. I have to like unveil a. Re
close. Yeah, it's like, what am I supposed to f you or thumb wrestle? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, both. To... He has since had all originals and official clips scrubbed from the internet, even though he is allegedly the king of not caring about being cancelled over a joke. The realities of labia, the Latin word for lips, has not been explored in any meaningful detail by either medicine nor modern society at large. Most men's exposure to labia is via the internet, and increasingly, young girls' and women's exposure to labia, and especially to what is considered normal labia, is via the internet. And normal, in this regard, is based on what labia should look like according to adult content. That is what has euphemistically been called the any outy labia distinction. In short, the only kind of vulva you will see in mainstream adult content is the rarest kind of vulva and labia, known as the any. Reddit is littered with stories of young women discovering and believing that their boyfriends or partners aren't attracted to them because they, like the vast majority of women, have what is called an outy as opposed to an any. I think my boyfriend isn't attracted to my vulva. He always talked about how much he loves innies, as in vulvas with no visible inner labia. All of his past partners had an any, and he would only watch explicit content that starred girls that fit his fondness. Unfortunately, I happen to have an outy. My inner labia protrudes and is very visible, and I'm reasonably ashamed knowing that he likes the opposite. When he saw me naked for the first time, I could tell by his face that he was expecting something better. He looked shocked for a minute and tried to hide it, but I saw the way he looked at me. Recently, we had a conversation on that topic, and I asked him what he enjoyed about innies so much that it makes such a big difference, and his response broke me. He talked about innies in such a lustful and loving way, listing every tiny detail that he adored about them so much. In the two years that we have been dating, he has never talked about my body this way. Generally speaking, social media and adult content are pivotal to this sudden development. This is what I think a perfect looks like. I'd compare this to a burger bun. So if you turn it round like that, it's like the bun of a hamburger. Nice and sealed shut. Nothing hanging at the end. So these are my outer lips. If we turn that around, it's a Big Mac. Of 480 women interviewed in 2015, just under half of them stated that they had qualms with their genitalia, including issues with the length and color of their labia. Plastic surgeries will advertise the procedures with headlines such as, head into swimsuit season with confidence with a labiaplasty. And the idea of self-confidence has been at the very root of all of this. And I think a good place to start in this little exploration into society's peculiar relationship with women's labia would be a brief history into societies, that is modern societies, love and then hatred for women's labia. But just before we get into this next fascinating and very important chapter, I would just like to give a huge thank you to today's video sponsor and friend of the channel, Beducated. Beducated is the number one sex ed app that you need to understand and explore your sexuality. With over 100 courses on everything sex ed, Beducated has been carefully curated by the world's top experts on everything sex, relationships, dating, communication, kink, you name it. I've especially enjoyed the immense variety of educational content to access. From video tutorials to practical exercises, I have been able to appreciate that sexuality is something that I can actually have have fun learning. And I really appreciate that underlying ethos of Beducated. The immense variety of content is evident in the fact that I've been able to use Beducated for everything. Dealing with rejection, a course on Beducated has helped me very much recently in a way that I was not expecting. I was recently dumped by somebody who I was preparing to be intimate with. It was very unexpected and very sudden and I've sort of been preparing myself to be intimate with somebody for the first time in six years but alas. And this course really helped me to process what had happened. It helped me to process rejection, how to deal with rejection, how to cope with it, how to understand what that means for 
me and just moving forward from the whole ordeal. And even though Beducated is an absolutely fantastic resource for perpetually single people like myself, it is also a huge resource and asset for couples and people in relationships. There are so many indispensable courses that couples can use to explore, to enjoy together and to experience together. From intimacy for people with disabilities to learning how to navigate desire differences in relationships, self-pleasuring together or exploring the pleasures and power of wax play. Beducated has courses galore for you and your significant others and it is so easy, straightforward and risk-free to get started. Use my coupon code KIDOLOGY to get 40% off your yearly pass by using my link down below. And as I said and what is amazing about Beducated is that it is completely risk-free. Why not test the waters with a 24-hour free trial, no strings attached and a 14-day money-back guarantee. Thank you so much to Be Educated for supporting the channel and for sponsoring this video and thank you for watching and supporting Be Educated because without you I would never get these opportunities which have helped me not just in being sponsored but have helped me personally in ways that I really would not have imagined. Now remember that is coupon code KIDOLOGY to get 40% off your yearly pass to Be Educated. And now let's get back to the video. <laughs> In Hinduism, Yoni is the symbol of the goddess Shakti. The Yoni is found in many Shiva temples alongside its masculine counterpart, Linga. Together, Yoni and Linga represent creation and regeneration. In Sanskrit, Yoni signifies the vagina, the vulva, and the urethra as the source or the place of origin. And this represents something important that was quite cross-culturally relevant in ancient times. Yoni and female sexual organs and sexual in general was a divine symbol. But this appears to have changed through the influence of Western orthodoxies from the 12th century onwards. Take the existence of Sheila Nagigs, which in crude terms are figurative carvings of bald naked women. These architectural grotesques appeared on buildings, castles and churches and even cathedrals throughout Europe from about the 11th or 12th centuries, particularly in England and then Ireland. They are still being spotted and cited to this very day. What is so noteworthy Worthy about them is not only the woman's intentional grotesqueness, but the full frontal display of their exaggerated vulva. Although scholars are not and probably will never be in consensus about the meanings and symbolism around these carvings, as they probably symbolize different things to different Europeans at different times and to different denominations based on their particular woes and superstitions, an underlying theme seems present to most. These exaggerated, repulsive vulvas were meant to warn against the sin of female lust. The best way to moralize to an illiterate population of devotees is through shame and fear. Though Sheila and the gigs must have been popular to have appeared on secular buildings like castles, suggesting a kind of pagan appeal to ward off evil. French painter Charles Eisen's fabulistic illustration of a woman with her skirts lifted, repulsing a demon away with her genitalia, has fascinating parallels to not only the secular appeal of Sheila and the gigs, but also to our modern age. And this isn't just something medieval or of the poorly literate back when. Medically supported sex myths abound to this day. Aristotle, described as the originator of the scientific study of life, claimed that a woman is simply an infertile male, which explains the coldness of her natural disposition. If an embryo is poorly nourished or the womb too cold, the embryo will become female. Females have just failed to become male and we are just mutilated males. Aristotle's theories of female equates to bad were influential over and brought into the writings of Thomas Aquinas, the greatest scholastic philosopher who officially influenced Catholic doctrine and philosophy up until the 20th century, Saint Augustine and Rousseau. Such scientific thinking and its remnants are highly influential. Think Sigmund Freud's theory of woman's castration anxiety in the form of penis envy. Girls resent their mothers for depriving them of a phallus or think the imagery and idea of female genitalia with teeth vagina dentata. Basically, vulva have been a major point of fear and shame in Western history. And what I find interesting is that today we perceive ourselves as being progressive, sexually sophisticated and open to the realities of sex and sexuality. But I would say that this really isn't the case. We really do exist in a modern society that has never conceptualized the vulva, that is the 
realities of the vulva as attractive, let alone as divine. Instead, the vulva, ironically, has become more bare and exposed due to modern grooming routines and beauty standards, and especially adult content's influence. Yet, simultaneously and increasingly, young girls and women are looking to completely alter its appearance via surgical procedures in the name of an enhanced quality of life. Popular depictions of it as a perfect looking flower or a perfectly ripe fruit seem to be doing more mystification than good. And I think this irony and mysticism is perfectly exemplified by what has been dubbed thong feminism. <laughs> Now, if we're going to dive into why modern young girls and women hate their vulvas, we have to delve into the world of underwear. And that is because I believe, based on my research, that the two are inherently related. When we think of women's underwear, we oftentimes just immediately think of the upper region of a woman's body. There is, for instance, a great deal of history and analysis into ancient women's strophiums and mammillaires, or into corsets, bras, and girdles. There's something seemingly feminine and clean about such things, something sexy. The same kinds of ideas of feminine and cleanliness, and most importantly, this mainstream idea of sexiness being associated with women's underwear, seems to have only become associated with women's underpants since the pants reduced in size and shape entirely. Because overall, since the 19th century, women's underwear has become greatly more fitted around the genital region. The mainstream popularity of thongs, g-strings, and especially bikini thongs must definitely be noted. In my mind, and as I can remember growing up as a teenager, it sort of felt like bikini thongs came out of nowhere and were suddenly, and are suddenly, everywhere. Since the early 2000s, thongs have been a popular staple among young girls. In 2002, comedian Janine Garofalo termed this thong feminism. The world of young and tween girls fashion was described in discomforting detail by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Laura Session Stepp. In her article, Nothing to Wear, she describes going into the trenches of, and I quote, the world of naked fashion for girls from high school on down, even to elementary school, the less is more look, flaunting breasts, bellies and bottoms. What many find truly astonishing is the tender age at which it's first aimed, a trend that older teenage girls themselves tag as disgusting. You can find terry cloth bikinis at Gap Kids, metallic looking bras and bikini underpants labeled girl identity in the girls department of Sears, and thongs for girls aged 7 to 14 at Abercrombie, the kids arm of the youth chain Abercrombie and Fitch. The quote-unquote bare look proliferated from the early 2000s. And this can largely be attributed to the internet and the greater proliferation of the ideal female body type as being hairless, pubescent, and bare. Take early 2000s supermodel Devon Aoki, who at age 16 replaced Naomi Campbell as the face of Versace in 1998. She exemplified the bare look on and off the runway. No bras, no underwear, unless thongs. Pubescent in appearance, and I would say most importantly, sexual with an aura of rebellion and empowerment, as opposed to whorishness. And this sexualization as being associated with rebellion and empowerment rather than whorishness is why it has feminist connotations to it, and hence thong feminism. The 2004 film DEBS, an initialism which embodies everything thong feminism, discipline, energy, beauty, and strength, and which Aoki starred in, is an action comedy following four skirted schoolgirls, groomed by a secret government agent to become the newest members of the elite national defense group, DEBS, which, as I said, stands for everything which the bare look claims to embody. Films like 13 came out around the same time and heavily featured the bare look in the form of low-cut jeans and protruding thongs. And I'm sure as you've guessed, this bare look goes into far more explicit territory. Women's hairiness in the 1960s and 70s and at the peak of the sexual revolution is in marked contrast to the near hairlessness of the female modern adult content star, as well as modern women in general. Modern women have made the Brazilian wax and the Hollywood Brazilian wax the most popular wax styles. In the 1970s, Playboy stopped airbrushing pubic hair out of its cover spreads and actually added pubic hair to its girl next door centerfolds in 1971, a startling change at the 
time. The two best-selling non-fiction books of the decade, Joy of Sex by Alex Comfort and Open Marriage, A New Lifestyle for Couples by Nena and George O'Neill, did not shy away from depictions of real, hairy female bodies and sexuality. The rock musical Hair featured a largely naked and hairy Broadway cast of men and women. Things have clearly changed. Now I reference all of this because I think it has a very interesting and very important connection to the rise in labiaplasties. Suddenly vulva are bearer due to adult content's mainstream influence. Suddenly vulva are bearer due to the greater sexualization of adolescent girls as well as young girls greater awareness of their sexuality and appearance from a much younger age. And I would say that over time vulva have become Bearer due to the greater destigmatization of casual sex. Take this 2011 study and prospective audit of 16 girls, ranging from ages 10.2 to 17.8, who between June 2009 and December 2010 consulted the same specialist gynecology service about their perceived abnormal genitalia. The reasons given by these 16 unrelated girls as to why they were seeking out these services were as follows. Six of the girls believed that the inequality in the length of their labia was an issue and the remaining 10 were concerned about their genitalia after comparing theirs to either their prepubescent siblings genitalia looking at the internet or looking at an anatomy book all 16 girls and in some instances their parents were seeking surgical intervention for what plastic surgeons and as a result gynecologists and pediatricians have termed labia hypertrophy it's like the whole world has gone mad Based on my research, the term labial hypertrophy appears to have started circulating in gynecological journals from the mid-1990s onwards. The term has increasingly been employed by female genital cosmetic surgery providers as some kind of accepted, recognizable condition. It refers to the enlargement of the labia minora, majora, or both. But being enlarged has never been comprehensively or definitively defined. And the realities of labial hypertrophy hypertrophy is beautifully put by the experts. For labial hypertrophy to attain disease status, normality in measurement and function would need to be defined. This work has simply not been done. Currently, labial hypertrophy is neither definable nor measurable. One person's hypertrophy could be another's normality. What I think is most important here is the attitudes of medical professionals to labia hypertrophy and labiaplasties. Now, in 2014, a cross-section survey of physicians at two national meetings was conducted. These two meetings were the Society of Gynecologic Surgeons and the North American Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology. 365 surveys were completed in total and the objective of the surveys was to establish the demographics of the physicians and to discover their approach to patients approaching them with labia hypertrophy and their approach to providing labiaplasties. 60% of SGS survey takers were male physicians, whereas 94% of NSPAG survey takers were female physicians. Now this, my dear viewers, is what really piqued my interest. A distinction was made between physicians offering their patients labiaplasties and physicians offering their patients reassurance. That is, reassurance in the form of, for instance, prescribing therapy or correcting misinformation. And the overall findings were telling. The findings established that, after logistic regression for sex and age, attendance at SGS remained associated with offering labiaplasty, whereas NSPAG attendance was associated with providing reassurance. Now, remember, the vast majority of SGS survey takers were male physicians, whereas the overwhelming majority of NASPAG survey takers were female physicians. So, to put it bluntly and in more layman's terms, male physicians were far more willing than female physicians to prescribe labiaplasties over reassurance. And I'd just like to note that interestingly, the survey also showed that expertise varied when it came to labiaplasties. A mere 28% of physicians surveyed felt very comfortable performing the procedure, and a concerning 11% felt very uncomfortable performing the procedure. What was noted overall was a lack of clear, consensual, and universal guidelines on how best and ethical 
specifically, physicians, pediatricians, and surgeons can properly aid patients, especially an increasing demographic of adolescent girls seeking labiaplasties. The thing about labia hypertrophy is that it is, in the vast majority of cases, entirely harmless. It is not a medical condition. Labial hypertrophy is harmless. It does not impact a person's sexual health and does not mean they have an underlying medical condition. Yet in being referred to as a condition by FGCS providers, it naturally leads to the assumption that if one has a condition, one needs to seek treatment for said condition. And increasingly, those in need of treatment are baby girls and young girls. In my section on thong feminism, I mentioned the case study of 16 adolescent girls seeking out labiaplasties. Case number one was a 14-year-old girl who sought out treatment after her pediatrician described her labia as hypertrophied. In some occasions, their parents were worrying that external genitalia were abnormal because labia minora were protruding beyond the labia majora. And as I said at the beginning of this video, over 50% of women globally have labia minora that is longer than, larger than, or protruding beyond their labia majora. So let's delve a little bit deeper into the meaning of hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is a physiological term that refers to the enlargement of an organ or tissue due to the increase in size of the cells. When you exercise your muscles at the gym, for instance, your muscles will increase in mass over time and with consistency. However, this increase, enlargement or toning is only temporary or achieved artificially through supplements and continued dedicated exercise. If you go to the gym, I'm sure you've realized that people have very different types of toning of muscles and results from muscular hypertrophy. Some people are naturally more muscular and others are not. What activities you do will also determine what is hypertrophied and what isn't. Muscular size and appearance also changes over time and due to many bodily and hormonal factors. The very same principles apply to vulvas. Yet unlike with muscles and our appreciation of their variants, FGCS providers are increasingly incentivized to suggest otherwise. Boston Children's Hospital was voted one of the best hospitals in the United States. Their Center for Congenital Abnormalities of the Reproductive Tract features a section on labial hypertrophy. As I said, the term labial hypertrophy has increasingly been used by the plastic surgery industry. Although the Boston Children's Hospital states that having larger than normal labia isn't dangerous, they state without any reference to examples, medical-backed studies, or samples that it may cause pain or chronic infections. Although it is true that women with larger, more protruding labia may be more susceptible to frequent UTIs, attributing this to abnormal labia would be misleading in the majority of cases. UTIs are far more common in women than in men, with some estimates suggesting that women are 30 times more likely to contract UTIs than men. Labia hypertrophy doesn't even feature as one of the secondary reasons for this. The length of a woman's urethra, which is much shorter than men's, means that bacteria can more readily reach the bladder in females relative to men. And the thing with UTIs, especially with women, is that some women are just more prone to them than others. And this can be for a variety of different, very specific reasons. By the age of 24, a third of women will have had at least one UTI. Acute UTIs affect 50% of women, and 25 to 30% of women will have a UTI more than once in her lifetime. UTIs are associated with bacteria, that is with E. coli, and in women with a vagina's pH level. The latter reason is why UTIs are more common in older women, when your pH level in your vagina is changing and has changed due to menopause and hormones. And notably, UTIs are more common in women who are living in care facilities or who have to use catheters. Catheters can cause irritation and can alter the pH level of the vagina. And all of this is just to say that the most common reason for the high level of UTIs in girls and in women is because of the close proximity of the anus to the vaginal opening and the urethra opening. It's E. coli. It's, it's just bacteria. That's the reason for it. It's all a matter of how you wipe, how you move. It's just proximity, which is natural for all women. 
Couple this with genetics, the effects of childbirth and menopause, chafing and rubbing from the likes of G-strings and thongs, as well as women bearing the brunt of contraceptive use, such as through spermicides and diaphragms. And now you have the reasons for why women may be more susceptible to UTIs. So it is a little concerning when plastic surgeons and cosmetic clinics are telling women who are 30 times more likely to contract UTIs than men that they can reduce that likelihood by getting a labiaplasty with absolutely no viable evidence to suggest that. The greater appeal of labiaplasties now is down to medical professionals increasingly using the language of normal or average when it comes to results. The truth of the matter is that average is very difficult to establish when it comes to labia and it is particularly difficult when to this day the internal and external female genitalia is so shrouded in mystery, disgust and fear beyond the adult entertainment industry. And as I've said, when you consider that over 50% of women have labia minora that is larger than their labia majora, it is very concerning that labiaplasties and treatment for labia hypertrophy are on the rise. Women's labia is constantly changing. It doesn't just change during puberty, but also during crucial periods such as pregnancy, childbirth, post-birth recovery, pre- and post menopause, a woman's labia minora and majora will never look the same throughout her lifetime. And the most disturbing part about all of this is that the American Society of Plastic Surgeons knows this all too well. Take this press release by the society titled High Rates of Physical Symptoms Among Women Seeking Labiaplasty. The abstract and introduction to the press release suggests that women are increasingly reporting physical and functional symptoms as the root cause to them seeking out labiaplasties. In fact, the entire press release is based on findings from a study of 50 women in an issue of plastic and reconstructive surgery. The 50 women ranged from ages 17 to 51. The only physical symptoms reported by these women was elongated labia, which isn't a symptom at all. Rather, it is simply an instance of two of the most common types of labia, asymmetrical labia or protruding labia. Neither are in fact abnormal. In fact, they are overwhelmingly the norm. The reality and the point of such press releases by the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, allegedly, is that FGCS is a booming market. The market was worth over 1 billion US dollars in 2019 and it is projected to grow by at least 34% between 2020 and 2026. Labiaplasties alone make up over 389 million US dollars of the entire market. Risks of labial surgery, such as bleeding, dehiscence, and infection, have been documented. However, they are often downgraded, and labiaplasty is usually advertised as a quick day case procedure with instant satisfaction yield. This, however, has little evidence base, as demonstrated by a recent review of the literature. Literature spanning from 1950 to 2009 was reviewed by Lauer et al. in 2010. The literature review, titled Labial surgery for well women identified a lack of high quality evidence for labial surgery in well women. Although plastic surgeons and their randomized, uncontrolled reports like to claim high levels of patient satisfaction, insufficient data exists on the clinical effectiveness of the procedure. Basically, Lau et al. point out the lack of reliable evidence supporting claims of drastic transformation in psychological, emotional, and sexual life associated with the surgery. The unfortunate and common thing with medical literature is that it too often fails to appreciate or delve into the complexities of the psychosociological phenomena that may actually be inducing women and young girls to seek out labiaplasties. And an obvious example of this disconnect between the medical literature and the complexities of psychosociological phenomena would be sexual satisfaction. 
Sexual satisfaction is a primary reason given by women for undergoing their labiaplasty. A women's wellness center and cosmetic surgery in Miami states that a labiaplasty can improve sexual health and function. Greater sexual confidence can lead to increased lubrication, which is pleasurable for both partners. This wrongly associates sexual confidence with normal physiological functions and sexual health. Sexual confidence has everything to do with how you see yourself, as well as how one's sexual partners perceive you and your anatomy and treat you intimately. The normalcy in shaming women for their vulva is loud and clear on the internet, and increasingly so among money-hungry plastic surgeons who are wet and ready to attribute hypertrophy to abnormality. The society has stooped so low as to call painful sex a symptom of elongated labia, as opposed to the real causes such as lack of lubrication, arousal, or painful sex as a result of oftentimes miscommunication and the skyrocketing influence of on our intimate lives. In fact, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons has shown itself willing to omit the complexities of psychosocial reality in order to convince women that they can pay to feel more attractive in bed. In their press release titled High Rates of Physical Symptoms Among Women Seeking Labiaplasty, the society writes, Regarding appearance, almost all patients were self-conscious and over half felt less attractive to their partner, experienced restrictions clothing choice and noted a negative impact on self-esteem and intimacy. Nearly all patients experienced at least four symptoms. Why, for instance, do these women feel less attractive to their partners? Now, a little tangent, an ex-boyfriend of mine on discovering that I had pubic hair had his entire fantasy of going down on me destroyed. He wanted me to get rid of my pubic hair and this was a conversation topic almost daily. Thankfully, on reflection, he dumped me before I went and and got anything done. But that kind of thing has really impacted my esteem and my confidence when it comes to my vulva and my body. Ever since the end of our relationship, I've gotten a Hollywood wax. And I don't do it for anyone. I haven't had sex or an intimate relationship or been in a relationship with anybody for over six years. But that dislike for how I look and that wanting me to look a particular way and getting very upset with me for not looking a particular way, as well as a whole other reasons for like my body and all of that and body body blah, it was not a good relationship at all. That stuff has really stuck with me and I still get waxed every single month. For who? I don't know either. <laughs> This is an example of a plethora of things that can make a partner or a person feel less attractive and experience less sexual satisfaction. And they stick with you. Seriously, it's been years. Yet the idea being propagated by the American Society of Plastic Surgeons and its equivalents is that feeling less attractive to a partner or having low self-confidence as a result of feeling less attractive or due to low sexual satisfaction is in fact a physical symptom that can be treated medically. It's like the genital equivalent to the boom in antidepressant prescriptions. The idea that medical intervention can treat psychosociological realities and complexities that medical literature refuses to engage meaningfully with, and therefore more pills or more plastic surgeries are prescribed. Women reporting discomfort when wearing certain types of clothing is attributed to normal physiological functions by the medical literature. It is not, however, a attributed to such clothes being made for one particular idea of how women's bodies are, nor the popularity of bathing suits and underwear being of a particular, well, style that causes chafing, discomfort, pain, and irritation for many. While in answering the question, how will labial hypertrophy affect my daughter's life? The hospital's answer in a section titled Symptoms and Causes is as follows. Labial hypertrophy should not affect her, that is your daughter's sexual life, but she may be displeased with a bulge in her bathing suit or underwear. She may experience discomfort or irritation during activities such as horseback riding. There are absolutely no symptoms referenced, evidenced, or listed of a medical nature beyond that of one's daughter perhaps being displeased with a bulge. But why? Why might your daughter be displeased with a bulge? The vagueness of these claims is increasingly being used by plastic surgeons and cosmetic clinics to sell an abnormality that isn't real. Little is known about when and also how external genitalia and labia minora actually develop in adolescence. 
senescence. And just as little is known about how the nerves and blood vessels in labia impact and contribute to a woman's sexual satisfaction, practices such as erotic massages, for example tantric massages, suggest that labia do play a role in a woman's sexual arousal and satisfaction. But that is a conversation that medicine is not quite ready to have yet. And can I just say that if you are a person who rides horses or cycles, you will inevitably at some point or other experience discomfort, irritation or chafing in your nether regions irrespective of the size of your labia. No matter the size or bulge, keep riding. I can't help but wonder about the limitations to the increasingly common counter-arguments given by critics to the sudden rise in aesthetic surgery. Plastic surgeons argue that the significance of such procedures is to enhance what is already there. For me, this argument is somewhat misleading, and purposely so, mainly because of how difficult it is for one to discern between wanting to enhance what is already there or wanting to fully metamorphosize. Not only is aesthetic surgery often influenced by trends, but evidence of the long-term psychosocial benefits of such procedures is yet to be extensively researched. In a paper that is highly positive of the labial procedure, the authors acknowledge that further studies are needed to investigate long-term outcomes, and more studies examining the impact of labioplasty on a woman's self-image and quality of life would add to our understanding of the motivations and expectations of women undergoing this aesthetic surgery. In short, there is a severe lack of follow-up long-term data, a lack of explorations into the real reasons why women are seeking out such surgeries. And I would hazard that a lot of this has to do with firstly shame and with in vain attempts to try and resolve psychosocial influences on one's quality of life via medical interventions. Because if explicit adult content, social media consumption and shame are what is influencing one to improve on one's looks. Is this truly improvement? Personally, I don't think so. And trust me, I am most definitely not an anti-cosmetic surgery purist, nor am I a believer that the natural body movement is doing much better when it comes to feeding on people's body issues in a very sanctimonious way. But I digress. Photographer Laura Dodsworth photographed over 100 vulvae for her book, Womanhood, The Bare Reality. In it, women share their stories and personal experiences. And one story really stood out to me of a 30-year-old old childless woman who underwent a labioplasty. I was awake throughout the procedure. He, that is the doctor, injected anesthetic into the labia and up into my bottom and then just sliced away. In reality, my labia were probably quite small pieces of skin, but to me they felt like big elephant ears. I lay there thinking how much better my life would be afterwards. My recovery was horrific. I knew there was going to be swelling, but it looked like a huge hamburger and I couldn't even put my legs together. It was very painful. I feel more comfortable day to day, sitting down or crossing my legs and jeans. My labia also used to get caught in tampon applicators, so now I can use tampons. But I don't really have any confidence. I wish I did. I'm trying to stop worrying about what other people think of me. I want to find out who the real me is because at 30, I still don't know. The reality is that surgery isn't going to help you find yourself, nor do anything aside from put some temporary band-aids on some very harsh wounds and inflicted by individuals, by society, and oftentimes by ourselves. It is so intensely reminiscent of thong feminism, marketed to young girls and women as a way for them to find empowerment and confidence in a form of self-sexualization. It promoted an eerie kind of eternal prepubescent youthfulness and rebellion that defied the very concept of age, of sexualization, and of the female condition. That is, the female condition, which is the human condition of being mortal, of aging, of changing, of constantly evolving and discovering yourself. And with the likes of Hailey Bieber and Kim K reigniting the thong craze among Gen Z, I cannot help but see similarities between these trends and the rise in procedures such as the labiaplasty. And you know, if a great thinker like Aristotle conflated his own sexism with rational scientific inquiry, your plastic surgeon and medical professional 
professional is in no way exempt from such things themselves. And I think that this is vital to remember when it comes to oftentimes taken for granted assumptions or hopes that medical professionals are there as impartial do-gooders, simply there to enhance your quality of life. But of course, at a cost. Thank you so very much for watching this video. I appreciate it greatly and I appreciate you giving me the time of day. I also ask that in the comment sections you're respectful and I'd love to hear from you about your thoughts and opinions about plastic surgery, about labiaplasties, about your labiaplasty if you have had one or if you thought about having one. If you are a man I'd also love to hear your opinions especially about this just because I think it's a very important discussion for everybody to have and I definitely do not want this video to be for one group of people. This is for everybody and anybody who wishes to enjoy this video and to take something from it. So I thank you very much. Thank you as always to my very generous patrons. I could not do this without you and I look forward to seeing all of you very, very soon in the next one.